So I'll meet you in the chapel. I'm going to go grab my notes. Ready? So I'll meet you in the chapel. All those. David had that desire. And we know when David had the Ark of the Covenant brought back, 
He arranged for a choir to be around the Ark of the Covenant 24-7, singing psalms. And we all know that if we all come to church, we wouldn't want to sing the same song over and over and over. Three times every service, because we sing three songs typically. And for every service throughout the year, which would be 52 multiplied by three. We want to sing something different, because when we look at songs, songs convey our feelings, our emotions, how we're feeling at that point in time. So we have different songs, and different people wrote different songs to convey those feelings and emotions. Same thing is true when it comes to David's choir. He wanted to compile a book of songs for those musicians to play, for those um, singers to sing, and thus we have the book of songs. It is believed that David started it for that reason. Now let me just find where I left off. Last week we began talking about certain key words throughout the book of Psalms. If someone would please read Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 2. Proverbs 25 2. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but it is the honor of kings to search out a matter. You know that we are supposed to search out the word of God? The Bible instructs us to study to show yourself approved unto God. Also, the other thing too is, how would you feel if you took a trip with somebody over to Paris, and you're standing there looking at the Eiffel Tower, and that person has no idea what it is, and they say, well, that's a pretty neat top tower. Well, you're going to do a face on it. Do you not know what that is? It's the Eiffel Tower. Everybody knows what that is. Yeah. Something. And why would that person not know what it is? Through ignorance. It's never been revealed to them. They maybe never studied it, read it out. Now, the same thing is true with the Word of God. There are times that we do see things through ignorance in the Word of God. But man, when we begin studying it out, things that we never thought of before starts popping out, and the Holy Ghost starts revealing things to us, we get the real meaning of things, and all of a sudden, it just opens up a whole new world. Just like that verse of, and he led captivity captive. Yes, we know that God went, Jesus Christ died on the cross, and he went down, and he led, uh, and he defeated the enemy. But man, when we start studying that out, we realize that what that really means is when he defeated the enemy, it was like that uh, Jesus Christ himself took all the demons of hell, chained them together, and paraded them through the streets of heaven or whatever city it was to show that he had victorious. Man, that just opens up a whole new ballgame to us. Or when we begin reading um, in the year that King used, I, God, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And we find, well, that's great. God has a train. He is the uh, He's almighty. He's a king. But man, when we start studying it out, we realize that that train is simple, uh, shows us and reveals to us that every time a king went into battle and he defeated the other king and he cut that off, it was added and so on to his train and it got longer and longer. We realize that Jesus Christ is truly the king of kings, the Lord of lords, because he's defeated the enemy. He's defeated all sickness and disease. Man, that just begins to get shouted around because at that point in time, we take that verse up, oh, man, AD was great at one time, but now we begin to really understand it. That is why we study the Word of God. And those things that maybe get boring, like the genealogies, or we maybe flip through real quick, when we begin studying them, things start popping out. So, we looked at some words last week. And I'm trying to remember where we left them off. And we left off with get it. Because we were talking about how it is a heart from Gath. Now these are words that occur throughout the book of Psalms. And I'll have to just make an indentation in my notes because there's one word that's indented when it should be brought out. But the next thing we're going to look at is, and I'm not really, Jonathan Rama, Rel, under Giddeth is point H. It should be a brand new point. And we are going with that because I am not even going to try to pronounce that one. 
I've butchered many names over the loudspeaker and Walmart over the years, but I am not trying this one. But anyhow, when we look at it and we begin studying it out, and we're, you're going to find that we refer to Strong's Hebrew Dictionary quite a lot because we want to understand the Hebrew meaning behind the word that was used. But the meaning, according to Strong's, is that it is silence of distance, especially among strangers, it is the title of a ditty or a song. It's used for a name of a melody. And when we look at it, it was probably the title of the tune. That we would read, turn to Psalm 56 and verse 1. I am not going to make you read that, but I will. And you're going to find with a lot of these words, it's not going to be really used in the verse itself, but rather it appears in the title of the poem. Where in Psalm chapter 56, it states, To the chief musician upon Jonathan Elam Ralkogum, it in my innocence in parentheses, cry of the dove in the distance, in the distant terebinth trees. Mictum, graven or permanent writings of David, when the Philistines took him in Gath. So that's where that word appears, Jonathan <coughs> And it was probably the title of the psalm. According to John John Gill, it translates to the words of Jonathan L. Rokum, may be rendered concerning the mute dove among them that are afar off or in a far, are in far place, or in a poor place. It may also suggest that this is the title, but also it would indicate possibly to the musicians and the singers what tune it should be sung to. Now, when we talk about Hebrew poetry, keep in mind when we talk about titles, the title of the psalm or psalm does not necessarily have to reflect any of the words within the song itself. Many times it was tradition that the title of the song had nothing to do at all with what the context of the writing of the song was. We'll move on to one more and we'll begin talking about today's song. I'll try not to bore you like I did last week. Hopefully it wasn't too bad. But I realize when we study words, it's not always the most exciting. But it is important for our study in the book of Psalms. But when we look at the next word, it is taken from Psalm 88, verse 1. It is the only time it appears in the entire book of Psalms. And it is the phrase, Mahela Lemeth. And in 81, we find the chief musician upon Giddeth, a Gittite harp we've already learned, a psalm of Asaph. So Asaph wrote this poem, or this psalm. Sevenfold command to praise God and worship Him. Now, it does not appear in my title here, but it appeared in my Bible here, but it apparently appeared in my Bible at home that I used for study. But this is the only place that it occurs. And when we break it apart, Mahalath comes from the Hebrew word Mahalath, and Lemeth comes from the Hebrew word Anah. And according to Strong's Dictionary, Mahalath means sickness, and it's probably the title or initial word of the popular song here. This Hebrew word is found twice in the book of Psalms, Psalm 53 and verse 1, and 88. Sorry, I get curious, I just want to make sure. Yeah, 53, 1, and 88, 1. Some believe that the word Mahalath may have been an instrument such as a lute or something for accompaniment, while others believe it may have been more along the, title, more along the lines of an actual guitar. We've also said it last week as well. A lot of times when we study these words, what we're going to find is 
that it might have been an instrument that's actually been lost to us. You gotta keep in mind, when it comes to Hebrew poetry itself, it was only just discovered here within the last maybe 300 years itself. So, there are things that have been lost to us and the actual meaning of it. But we're, some of it's based upon speculation. So, a lot of times we're gonna find that it's gonna refer to maybe the title of the song, the instrument that was meant to be used in the song, or, and or both. Now, when we break it apart and look at the last word, Lanith, it means, uh, comes through the idea of a looking down or brow beating to depress, literally, more figuratively, a, be, a base, a base self, afflict, answer, chase himself, you hardly with, defile, exercise, force, gentleness, humble, to hurt, ravish, sing, submit yourself, to weaken. When we look at that word in the Hebrew, it is found in 15 verses in the book of Psalms. They're all there. We're not going to go into detail and look at each one. But when we look at it, rough, when it's translated, more along the lines means humbled. It's been translated humbled, afflict, afflicted, weakened, hurt, and afflictions. And when we actually study out, it more look, it looks more like that it was the title of the poem than anything. When we go back and study it through the Septuagint and the Vulgate itself, it means to answer. Martin Luther himself, now when we study, look at the words of Martin Luther, Martin Luther has been referred to as the commentator of commentators. So he's revered very highly. Now when we look at commentators, we got to keep in mind, the Bible is the inspired word of God, theirs is not. But we can take it, if it lines up with the word of God, great. If part of it doesn't, well, then we cut it and toss it to toss it aside. But Martin Luther had this to say about it. He said that it translates to sing of the weakness of the miserable. While the translation of this phrase may vary, Martin Luther probably was the, probably the closest to the actual translation. Professor Alexander translated it concerning afflictive sickness. And when we look at Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, he leans that it is both the title and a reference to a musical instrument. The thing about Charles Spurgeon is he is the prince of preachers, but when it comes to commentators on the book of Psalms, he is the definitive work with the treasury of data. When we look at the book of Psalms by itself, he wrote two books probably about that thick each. So when it comes to studying the book of Psalms, you're going to find me referencing him quite a bit. But Something just on the sidelines about Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon had a real relationship with God, if you actually read about his life. There has been at least one time on occasion it's been said that they actually had to drag him out of prayer and it took men, two men to carry him because he was so deep in prayer to the pulpit because it was time to preach. But Charles Spurgeon was the one that wrote the Treasury of David, and in that he wrote, I lean to the idea that the words Mahalath are intended to denote some musical instrument of the plaintive order. And in this opinion, and uh, he writes, quotes Kim Chi and other Jewish writers perfectly agree with that. They assert that as a wind instrument answering very much to the flute and employed mainly in giving utterance to sentiments of grief upon occasion of great sorrow and lamentation. So not only does he mention that as the title, but he goes on to comment that it was probably a flute, and that flute was used in songs of grief, in, according to the Jewish tradition, or in the Jewish history, or in their style. We'll stop there with the words, and we're going to transfer today to today's notes from the book of Psalms. I have no idea why I just put my notes to the side. But I am going to go there. And we are going to go to Psalms chapter 1. We are not going to go into detail and look at every psalm. Otherwise, you might as well take 150 and divide it by 52. And that's how many weeks it's going to take to go through the book of Psalms. Just doing one chapter every week. But just so we know what we're looking at, I will go ahead and read Psalms chapter 1. 
It contains six verses. And if you want to turn there, we'll all read it together. I'll just read it aloud. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth it shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Now when we look at this passage, if we are going to break out our study skills, how many groups of people are we discussing in this passage? Yes, Mom. We are dealing with two different groups of people. You can count them on one hand. And what are those two groups? The righteous and the wicked. Or we could go the righteous and the ungodly. It doesn't really matter. But the righteous and the wicked are both there. The godly and ungodly. We have two main groups. So God didn't say the Jews and the Egyptians, but he lumped all mankind into one category. Either you're godly or you're ungodly. And we know on the day of judgment that there are going to be exactly two groups. The saved and the unsaved. Those that enter into heaven and those that do not. And in this passage, we find that these two groups are compared and contrasted. They are looked at one side by side with the other. And what do we find out about the righteous in verses 1, 2, and 3? We find that they are blessed. We find that they are happy in verse 2. And we find that they are fruitful. And we will go back and reread those for reiteration. Verse 1 said, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Then in verse 2, we find that he's happy. But his delight or happiness is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And in verse 3, we find that he is fruitful. In verse 3, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. So he shall be fruitful. Then we have that contrasted with the wicked. And what does God inform us about the wicked? He tells us in verse 4 that he is worthless. In verse 5 that he is unstable. And in verse 6 that he is doomed. And I'll go ahead and read those final verses. The ungodly are not so. Take notice that he is worthless. But are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. And the chaff being compared to the wheat we find throughout Scripture. And the chaff is that part of the wheat that has to be broken off. is good for nothing. And when they tread it down, the wind comes and blows it away. It's worthless. There's no value to it. Otherwise, they would have gathered it up. They would have found some use for it. But there is no use for the chaff. In verse 5, we find that he is unstable. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. He cannot stand there. And finally, in verse 6, he is doomed. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall what? Perish. So he is doomed. There is no hope for him. This discussion is on the two ways of man. The, the godly and the ungodly. The good, the righteous, and the wicked. Spurgeon uses this discussion as proof of Psalm 1 consisting of two divisions. Since part 1 discusses the godly in the first half of the psalm, and the ungodly was discussed in the latter book of the psalm. We find that even in this uh, 
breakdown that we read in the comparison of the wicked and the righteous, which I did steal from somebody. It's not in your notes, but I can't remember who I took that from. But if we look at verses 1, 2, and 3, it's about the righteous. If we look at 4, 5, and 6, it's about the wicked. There are six verses, and all those verses are divided perfectly. One to one group, and the other to the other, to the second group. If we would try to dis um, discover the key words of this passage, and when we actually study out passages, key words are those words that are used more prevalently, that best used, are used to describe that passage. Maybe they're the most used, and they are subject to interpretation. But for the sake of our study, I went with godly and ungodly because that's exactly what we're dealing with. Those two groups, those are the two main words being used over and over and over. They are the ones used for comparison and contrasting. If you want to come up and you can think of better words that are used throughout the psalm to best describe it, go for it. Because these are just to help us better understand the passage. They are not set in stone. If we were to talk about the main verses in this passage, when we look at main verses, those are the verses that we can pick out that if we pull this verse out of this chapter, this is the verse that would describe this chapter in a nutshell. In a nutshell. It would summarize it. I went with a chapter with verses 1 and 5, and those read, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. And five goes, Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Those two verses, I believe, summarize this entire psalm, or psalm, however you want to refer to it, in a nutshell. It summarizes it. The godly, though, inherit eternal life, and the ungodly, they will inherit doom. We do see Christ in this passage because he desired to do the will of the Father and he found happiness there. When we look throughout the Word of God, the whole Bible, we see Jesus Christ in it in one form or another. And we can pick him out. Is this passage dealing and talking directly about Jesus Christ? No, it's talking about the ungodly and the ungodly. But can we see characteristics of Jesus Christ in it? Absolutely. And we find that, it is, that if we would look at this in the eyes of Jesus Christ and relating him to this passage, we find throughout his life that he desired to do the will of the Father and he found happiness there. Because happy is the man that walketh and delighteth in the Lord. What does Luke chapter 22 and verse 42 state? Luke 22, 42. And someone else read Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Not my will, but thine be done. We know that Jesus Christ was willing to go the distance. If we would look at that in light of this passage in Psalm chapter 1, he was blessed because he did not go the way of the sinner or the ungodly, but he found his delight in the law of the Lord. And that's where he meditated day and night. He was staying within the will of the Father. And what does Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 inform us? concerning Jesus Christ. For the joy set before him, he endured the Christ and endured the cross. Verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. The happiness that was set before him, that joy, because of that, he knew that he could do the will of the Father and he found joy in doing the will of the Father. Even to the fact of the work of the cross. And because of the work of the cross, he endured the cross 
for one reason. That happiness that was set before him because he delighted himself in the will of the Father. And what was the happiness there that is being referred to? It was the church. It was you and I. Spurgeon wrote in the Treasury of David, Some believe that this psalm is a description of the character and reward of Jesus Christ. Now, let's look at the history on this psalm a little bit. Some claim that this psalm was written during the Maccabean era. Now, when I talk about the Maccabean era, if I would say the book of Maccabees, that should ring a bell with some of us. Because we've had this discussion in the past in Sunday school. The book of Maccabees, while we can refer to it historically, it is not one of the books of the Bible, regardless of what other denominations might say, what, regardless of what the Catholic Church would even add, because that book of Maccabees, first and second Maccabees, is one of the books of the Apocrypha. That group of books that is not part of the inspired Word of God, but if we would study out the Apocrypha is where the Catholics get a lot of their false doctrines, if not all their false doctrines, but that's the era we're talking about. And when we look at the writing of, writings of those books, may anyone tell me when the Apocrypha was written? I know it's been a very, very long time. The Apocrypha, those uninspired books of the Bible, were written after Malachi, but before the book of Matthew. So that 500 years of silence in between Malachi and the birth of Jesus Christ, that's when the Apocrypha was written. And that's when we find the Maccabean era going on because that is the time frame that uh, different rulers rose up within the Jews to try to take back their homeland from the Romans and the Greeks. And that's also the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, who is a type of the Antichrist. He offered a pig on the altar in the temple. Others claim that this is pre Maccabean age while others claim that it refers to the coalition of the Edomites, Ammonites, and other heathen groups that came against the Jews after the um, exploits of Judas Mac uh, Maccabeus around 164 BC. Now, there's one thing that we need to keep in mind. Who is it that is believed compiled the first section of the book of Psalms, which is this section? There's only one, quote, um, one editor in the book of Psalms that we know by name. David. And was David around <coughs> over those 500 years between Malachi and um, Matthew? Was he around somewhere there? No, he was much older. So, if David compiled the first section of the book of Psalms, according to Psalm 72, and don't get me on the verse because I'm not there right now, where... We know that the Psalms of David have ended. Obviously, this Psalm is much, much older than most people in commentators write. Remember what I said about commentators. They are not the inspired word of God. They can be wrong from time to time. And even if every commentator says that it's this way, but the word of God is clear that it's not that way, the word of God is the inspired word of God and not the commentator. But very few will say that David used this psalm, Psalm 1, as an introductory psalm into the rest of his section of the psalm book. Now we're going to take a quick look at the poetic style because well, what's one thing we know about psalms? Some psalms, before you have the melody, first you have the words. And if you have just words and no melody, that makes it a poem. So there is a poetic style to the book of Psalms and Psalm 1 as well. We've touched on it in the past roughly, but in verse 1, we find that the Sonata's parallelism style was used, and these are notes that we've talked about in several weeks past when we talk about poetic, um, Hebrew poetry in general. 
And what is the, the synonymous parallelism? It is the same thing being repeated in different words. And when we look at verse 1, that is exactly what we find. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. He doesn't walk in their counsel, nor standeth in the way of the sinners. So he's still not communing with them. So it's the same thing in different, in different words. Nor standeth in the way of sinners. Same thing, different words. Nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So he has no company with them. And we find that being repeated in four different phrases. So it's the exact same thing being repeated in different words. And then we find in verse 6. I should have put verse 6. Yep, verse 6. We have what they refer to as antithetic parallelism. The thought of the first line is emphasized by contrasting the thought in the second line. So if we read verse 6, For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. He knows the way of the righteous. And then how are we going to contrast that? But the way of the ungodly shall perish. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. It's going to be prosperous. But the way of the ungodly shall perish. So we see two different forms of Hebrew poetry being compared to in this verse. Now, we're going to wrap it up real quick because we're running out of time. But if someone would please find Joshua 1 8 and hold it, Joshua 1 8, and someone else find Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 8. Jeremiah 17 8 and hold that. We're going to start with Joshua 1 8. The book of the law shall not be poured out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate thereon day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Some believe that verse two of the of, cha, of Psalm chapter of Psalm one was actually inspired by Joshua one eight. Now listen to Psalm. Go ahead and read that one more time, please, Mom, and then I'll read Psalm one eight. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. And this is verse 2 of Psalm. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And then some believe that verse 3 of Psalm chapter 1 was actually inspired by Jeremiah 17, 8. If someone has that, go ahead and read it. He shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and as spread as not waters by the river. And Psalm chapter 3, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he do shall prosper. When we look at this psalm, it could not be written during the Maccabean era if David was to be the editor of the first section of Psalms. It is believed that that was the prelude or the introduction the introductory statement to David's portion when it comes to his song book. And it summarizes in a nutshell the two people that will exist from the beginning of creation all the way to the end. And that is the godly and the ungodly. And we as the godly need to delight in the Lord and in his law because we meditate day and night. Why? Because it's then only then will our desires become more like God's desires. Our thoughts will become more like His thoughts. When we meditate upon the Word of God, and we are sincere about it, and we are living right, the Word of God is quick and it is powerful, and it washes us and it cleanses us. And when we meditate upon the things of God versus the things of this world, it is taking this old carnal fleshly mind and slowly changing it into the mind of Christ because our desires are no longer on the desires of the world, but we're thinking about those godly things. We're thinking about God's word, and we are allowing it to change us into his very image. And because of that, the closer we get to God, 
the more we'll delight in his law because we are being trans transformed in, in, and changed into the very image of Jesus Christ. And how can people, how can Christians endure persecution? How can um, people in foreign lands that are being beheaded for the sake of Christ, that are watching their family being mowed down, saying either you convert to um, our religion, whether either you denounce Christ, or we're going to kill them. How can Christians endure Muslim torture where they actually submerge them in a gas and a liquid where it slowly eats them away at their skin and their bones over time? How can such Christians endure such things? Because for the joy set before them. Their joy is not the cross of Christ, but it is to take up their cross. And when they take up their cross, and follow Jesus Christ, and they endure the joy, the joy that is set before them, is not the same joy that Jesus Christ had, which is the church, his bride, but rather is that hope, that blessed hope that one day, when life is over, we will see the King of Kings, we will see the Lord of Lords. And it's not just a matter of seeing him as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, because he refers to the church as his bride, someone that is intimate with him. And when we meditate upon the law of the Lord, when we meditate upon the Bible, our relationship with him draws closer and closer and closer. And it's no longer the joy set before him that I must endure till I get heaven, but it's the joy that one day I am going to see him face to face. Does anybody have any thoughts? Any questions? Anything they want to add at this point? If not, let us remember that the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. And he knows you and I. Let us bow our heads in prayer and go before his throne right now. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and will do. Lord, we thank you that your God who reigns one high and there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, Lord, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be good soil for your word to fall on, that we may remember it throughout the week. But even greater than that, that it would take root in our hearts, Lord, that we would have a greater desire to draw closer to you than ever before, and that your word would transform us and change us, Lord, that we may be like you even more. Anoint the pastors of pride in his lips as he brings forth your word today. Anoint the song leader and the musicians as they praise you upon the string instruments and the vocal cords, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that we would be sensitive to your spirit, Lord, no matter what, that the gifts of the spirit may be in operation, Lord. We pray and ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.